Hey everybody, welcome to Tech for Psych, where we combine the latest in neurotechnology with ancient wisdom to supercharge your brain. I'm your medical doctor, confidant, Dr. Cody Rawl. I'm here on my annual trip up to Alaska. It's very nice, very serene. I've got the ocean surf crashing below me. I'm up on the bluff near Homer, Alaska. A little bit of wind today. Hopefully it's not going to mess with the audio too much. But today I wanted to talk to you about a theory called the entropic brain theory, largely put forth by a brilliant researcher at Imperial College London, Dr. Robin Carhart Harris. He's been all over uh, different neuroscience circles lately, mainly because of his work with brain imaging when it comes to taking a look at psychedelics like psilocybin. What we've seen through our different technologies through EEG, functional MRI, and other measurement tools like magnetic encephalography is that the brain is in a constant state of flux. No matter whether you're sleeping, whether you're in a coma, or whether you're doing math problems, uh, these different brain circuits are resonating in different patterns and interacting with each other in sort of a nested fashion. A uh, small perturbance in that vibration frequency can uh, perpetuate throughout the different brain circuits and create an avalanche of, uh, in a cascade of different brain signals. And if you think of the brain as having sort of a uh, alphabet of brain fluctuations, that's encoding anything from, uh, like I said, doing a math problem to unfortunately maybe even having a seizure if too many fluctuations fall into sync in a bad resonance pattern. So Robin Carhart Harris talks a lot about entropy. So what is entropy? Entropy is going from this state of organization to randomness. It's actually a thermodynamic term. And when you take a look at the brain, uh, it seems to be that a lot of the circuits are actually dampening down brain activity through different receptors like GABA, which alcohol actually works on. And if you let these brake stops stop their inhibition, you get a lot of enhanced brain activity. And the weird thing about psychedelics is that they seem to promote this enhanced brain activity, especially in higher association brain areas in which you are determining very psychodynamic properties like sense of self and reality testing. Dr. Carhart Harris is a proponent for understanding the brain through a concept called system entropy. Uh, here we're revisiting a big data concept in which a system with many constituent parts and elements uh, displays emergent properties at a global level beyond those of the individual components. You can think of an individual neuron firing not manifesting consciousness, but when you get a billion of these things communicating to each other, it manifests itself in what we know as consciousness or intelligence. Uh, what's important about this complex system is that any energy coming in, whether that be sensory information or what have you, shifts the entire system away from its temporary equilibrium and causes the system to display unique characteristics as it transits positions and it should be a narrow window between order and chaos. You can think of these neurons firing with electrical activity and communicating to each other uh, and that all laying in a balance between order and chaos. So in order for that to work, the brain and this complex system needs to be nimble and reactive. The system needs to be sensitive to perturbation, meaning that any of those signals coming in need to be able to cascade and propagate throughout the system so that it can achieve different resonance patterns and have these many different transiently stable states that reflect the alphabet of the brain and it manifests itself in our behaviors and our thoughts and everything that we associate the brain being able to do. The fact that we see psychedelics enhancing brain entropy suggests that our normal waking consciousness is actually a quite constrained state of neural activity when you look at entropy. So why am I talking about all this? Well, this is actually becoming very important in the field of mental health, in the field of psychiatry, because uh, different substances like psilocybin are reaching uh, stage three clinical trials, which is a big deal, meaning that they found actual therapeutic benefit in stage two enough to actually warrant uh, further trials to get FDA approval. And where this is actually becoming really exciting, especially for certain populations like uh, cancer diagnoses. So people that are diagnosed with end-stage cancer, obviously they're going through <laughs> I couldn't even imagine a stage of their lives that um, comes to terms of their own mortality. And what seems to happen in these psilocybin trips that are well documented in which they're uh, giving these cancer patients uh, a dose of psilocybin to become highly dissociative and enter that psychedelic state is that afterwards they come back and say it was one of the most important experiences of their lives and that they don't uh, fear death as much. And 
so that's the subjective side and that in itself is very powerful and the um, data for that has become quite robust and I think that we're going to be seeing treatment with um, especially cancer patients but also likely uh, depressive patients with psilocybin in depression specifically and quite often depression that's linked with uh, obsessive compulsive tendencies as you can imagine these people you know OCD is like very clinical OCD is where people get these repetitive patterns like maybe if I had this stick and I felt like I just needed to break it every five seconds because I just had this compulsion to break the stick and like a great example of that would be someone that can't get out of the house because they're having to wash their hands all the time with soap or they're worried about germs that type of thing uh, heavily heavily stuck in their default mode network uh, they can't get out of it one of the defining characteristics of that is inflexibility of thinking meaning that they have a way of doing things and they can't imagine changing up their behavior to do things differently and that often leads to depression because if they feel like they are not happy and won't change their behavior well they're kind of stuck between a stone and a hard place so that can be very de detrimental for people and uh, you find a lot of similarities between people that have high anxiety, OCD, and depression. These are all um, labels that we put on people without actually understanding the brain scans underneath. And now that we have more versatile neurotechnology and machine learning techniques, we can start parsing these out and see the similarities of brain scan characteristics between these people that are highly dysfunctional. And now you have the psychedelics coming into play where uh, you have researchers like Robert and Carhart Harris running these clinical trials and doing brain scans and trying to decipher what exactly is going on with these people. So you have uh, the part that I talked about, the subjective experience of these people actually being um, feeling, feeling like they are um, improved therapeutically from these experiences under a clinical setting. And this is a, where I should actually talk about um, a lot of what Robin Hart, Carhart Harris, uh, Tim Ferriss has been talking about this a lot too. I don't know if you guys know Tim Ferriss. He's author of the four hour work week, but he's actually taken all of his funds. He used to be a tech startup investor, actually pulled out a ton of his funds and put it into psychedelic research because from what I understand, Tim Ferriss actually uh, suffered from depression for some time and really feels like there's a lot of medical benefits to introducing these substances, especially with our neurotechnology today, understanding what's actually going on with the brain and being able to use it therapeutically. But time and time again, it's stressed that um, recreational use of these powerful substances is highly um, cautioned against because set and setting is so important. That's why in the clinical setting you would have like a shaman, like the ancient um, cultures had shamans that would guide people through these experiences and uh, it's important. One of the reasons why ketamine has been approved by the FDA to be used for depression is ketamine is a little bit of a different substance. It has a lot of high activity at the NMDA receptor rather than serotonergic receptor, but there's some similarities there. But one of the most defining characteristics is that at low doses, they're actually using it with people. It is like a psychedelic experience. Um, but at that low dose, they wanna make sure that it wears off quickly <clears throat> so that people can go back to, you know, go back home, um, you know, get home after the experience. Like a ketamine uh, treatment is a couple of hours. Psilocybin might last something like eight hours and LSD can last 12 or more hours. So you can see the differences in, in timestamps that people um, would engage in using these substances and how ketamine would be more um, amenable to the the uh, laboratory or the medical treatment setting. Around this time last year, I was talking about a book called Stealing Fire by Stephen Cutler and Jamie Wheel. And they really recommended that you have your daily practices, which should be exercise, meditation, which actually do a lot of what I'm talking about. Um, they cause hypofrontality, um, a feeling of connectedness with your surroundings. They get you out of your head, out of that default mode network. That's really what I advise uh, my clients to be doing. Um, that's really at my point of my career, what I see myself as doing for this movement is uh, not focusing so much on psychedelics or um, the chemicals side, although it's interesting to take a look at what receptors are hitting and how we can incorpor incorporate that into the clinical picture. 
But in order to handle anything like that, or if you don't want to do those activities, which is completely fine um, and probably more appropriate for the majority of the population, engaging in meditation actually will allow you to reach similar states and or even be able to handle those types of states even better if you're actually to uh, use them therapeutically. So uh, what that Stealing Fire book did very well was lay out these different practices that you can do every day, every month, and then you know once a year be doing an art festival like Burning Man or uh, some other kind of experience that uh, gets you outside of your head. And that's really what the theme is, is you have all these different ways like extreme sports, meditation, exercise, um, psychedelics, different um, experiences like neurofeedback or brain stimulation, um, you, you know, eventually I just, you know, I just interviewed the Halo Neuroscience CEO and they're taking a look at using direct electrical stimulation on the, <laughs> you know, on the frontal lobe to induce meditative states. There's all different types of ways that we could um, therapeutically affect the brain so that we're not stuck in the default mode network and we're not uh, so closed in by ourselves and we're able to feel connected to the universe around us and feel happy, healthy, vibrant and alive and motivated to do things in our lives. There's all these different methods that we can do and taking a look at uh, work by people like Robin Carhart Harris and his work with brain imaging and psychedelics kind of leads us to what is going on with the brain there. Why is it good for cancer patients to uh, experience a psilocybin trip? Why is it that uh, ketamine is now an FDA approved uh, medicine for depression? There's some commonalities here and that's why I love taking a look at theories like the entropic brain theory because um, if you're thinking about the brain being in a very constrained system on normal waking state that allows us to sort of filter out perception so that we can do our daily routines effectively and then uh, take a look at altered states and see how that opens up brain activity and that kind of incapacitates yourself to actually be able to do daily activities but it's very therapeutic at the same time if it's done in a closed safe setting there's something there there's some kind of medicinal component there and it's very much worthwhile taking a look at which is why people like tim ferris have pulled all their money out of uh, investing in tech startups and into uh you know psychedelic uh research um, backed by map society was is a really good example so i just wanted to talk about that you can know, kind of use the entropic brain theory um talk to nest in this type talk about you know what is going on with the research why is ketamine now an fda approved uh, treatment for depression what commonalities does it have with different substances like psilocybin or lsd and uh, you know the technology that we're using to investigate these type of things so i hope you enjoyed this rant it's a nice little um, place to do it to think about these big questions up here on the bluff so this is dr cody raw with tech for psych if you want to take a look at my talk on stealing fire take a look right here. This will fill you in on uh, what I talked about last year with uh, the Stealing Fire book.